Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to, to be here, and I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues uh, in the genetics department for uh, hosting this and uh, asking me to spend a little bit of time this evening talking about seizures and epilepsy. Seizures are amazingly common. One in 10 people are going to have a seizure at some point during their lifetime. One in 10, 10% of everyone. Next to headaches, seizures are the commonest neurologic thing that happen to people. So they're incredibly common. Seizures are more common in children and in the elderly. And most of us in the room are enjoying the time in our life when we're least likely to have a seizure and develop epilepsy. Children have seizures for lots of different reasons. Younger children are particularly prone to having seizures if they spike a high fever with an ear infection and they have a grand mal seizure or a convulsion. It's very frightening and terrifying, but something that doesn't hurt the children and they recover completely. And those are called febrile convulsions. Children are more likely than adults to have a seizure if they've had a blow to the head or a concussion. And any time a child is particularly sick or recovering after anesthesia from surgery, they may have a seizure. Some children though, and adults, are prone to having recurrent seizures. Not just a one-time event, but something that happens over and over again. And that's what epilepsy is. So epilepsy means that someone has an underlying susceptibility for recurrent seizures. And that affects one in 26 people. So one in 26 people in America will develop epilepsy at some point during their life. Many of you are probably familiar with the advertising campaign of the Autism Society that shows you know, you know, the really serious concerns about how common autism is. Affects one in 150 children, one in 80 boys will develop autism, and those numbers are shocking. But one in 26 people will develop epilepsy. It's more common than Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, and muscular dystrophy all added together. This is a curve of uh, the occurrence of epilepsy over a lifetime. And you can see that it's particularly common in the first year of life, and then drifts down through childhood. And this is where most of us in the room are, where it's the least likely to occur. And then as we get older, it becomes more and more common again. And then about by age 70, it's as common as it is in early childhood. Obviously, the causes of epilepsy in the older population is different from the causes here. In this age group, it's a lot of genetic causes, some of the things that we'll be talking about this evening. And at this end of the spectrum, it's more related to strokes, brain tumors, and advanced stages of diseases like Alzheimer's disease. Seizures themselves are due to an abnormal electrical discharge in the brain. So our brain works by electrical signaling. We have about 150 billion nerve cells in our brain, and those cells send little electrical impulses, and those impulses allow us to think, move, be awake, remember things, feel things. And if that signaling goes abnormal, it can cause a seizure. The signs and symptoms are what a person experiences and what people witness during a seizure is dependent upon what part of the brain is involved in the seizure and how much of the brain is involved. There's officially about 30 different types of seizures in our classification system, and seizures can look like almost anything. Sometimes children can have a seizure that causes them to stop and stare. Those are often not recognized right away as being seizures, and children are thought to be daydreaming or perhaps having an attention problem. And daydreaming and having attention problems are much more common than stirring spell seizures, but um, sometimes there's quite a delay in recognizing that the stirring spells are seizures. Some people see things, hear things, feel things. Sometimes seizures cause you to move abnormally. And then the most dramatic seizures are seizures where you lose consciousness 
fall to the ground, you're stiff and shaking all over. And those are called convulsions or grand mal seizures. We have a classification system of seizures so that doctors studying one kind of epilepsy can communicate effectively with doctors talking about a different kind of epilepsy and in different parts of the world. Every two years we have the International Epilepsy Congress where doctors from all over the world get together and we can talk a common language because we all use the same classification system. And it's created by the ILAE, or the International League Against Epilepsy. And our current classification system of seizures has been around for quite a while, in 1981. The classification system is always trying to go, uh, undergo changes and revisions, but it's hard to get everybody in the world to agree on a change. So we're, most of us still use this 1981 classification. And it bases the seizure types on consciousness. So if someone loses consciousness and passes out completely during a seizure, we know that if you had an EEG going, the EEG activity would involve all of the brain. And that person would lose consciousness. And we call that a generalized seizure. If the person doesn't lose consciousness, they're either fully awake or they may be confused, but they're not unconscious, then we know that the seizure activity is involving only part of the brain, and we call those partial seizures. If your consciousness is completely normal, we call those simple partial seizures, and in the vernacular, those are referred to as auras, and you might have heard that people can experience an aura before the seizure. Well, that aura is a simple partial seizure that's involving only a small part of the brain. If the seizure spreads and involves more of the brain, then the person becomes confused and disoriented, and we call that a complex partial seizure. We also classify epilepsy. The epilepsy classification system is much more complicated, and the one that we're currently using has been around since 1989. And it includes not only what someone experiences during the seizure, so what the seizure looks like, but it also includes the information that we get from the EEG, the electroencephalogram, the electrical recording of the brain, and the underlying etiology, so the results of an MRI of genetic testing. And the search for the cause of epilepsy always begins with the MRI scan. And we really divide the different epilepsies into whether you have a normal MRI or an abnormal MRI. If you have something abnormal on the MRI scan, which is a detailed picture of the anatomy of the brain, we call that abnormality a lesion. And we refer to people with abnormal MRIs as having a lesional type epilepsy, and people with a normal MRI as having a non-lesional epilepsy. And most non-lesional epilepsies are genetic. These include things like cortical dysplasias, which are a physical abnormality that's caused from abnormal signaling, and when the brain was being created, a region of the brain didn't form normally. It's caused from genes. Channelopathies, that we'll talk about more in a few minutes, and ligand receptor disorders and neurometabolic disorders. Those are complicated terms, but I'm going to explain them a little bit more. This is 10 seconds of a child's EEG. An EEG lasts about an hour, and uh, we look for abnormalities during the brain signaling during that hour of electrical recording. And the children have about 21 electrodes on the outside of their head attached with glue onto their scalp. And the child rests quietly. We like them to fall asleep. And we record the brain waves. And uh, this is a very dramatic change in brain waves. And it's a seizure. So the first second of the EEG, this is normal brain activity. And then there's suddenly this high amplitude spike and slow wave. So there's a spike and a slow wave and a spike and a slow wave. And uh, you can see that it's in all the channels. 
So this is a generalized seizure, and the child during those seconds of that abnormal discharge is completely unconscious. And this is a typical seizure for childhood absence, which used to be called petit mal epilepsy. It's one of the easily recognized childhood forms of epilepsy. And fortunately, this epilepsy goes away. So it's one of the epilepsies that has a pretty good prognosis, and we can uh, let families know that nearly all of the time, the children will have this epilepsy from about five or six years of age until just before adolescence when it goes away. And untreated, these children usually have hundreds or thousands of these seizures in a day that cause them to stop and stare. This is a cortical dysplasia, one of the reasons that we do an MRI scan. And this is a horizontal picture through someone's head just above the ears. And you can see that there's this white spot here. And that's an area of the brain that didn't grow normally. And these are special types of MRIs that show us the connections of different parts of the brain. This is a brain metabolism study called a PET scan. And it's very helpful for us understanding where seizures are coming from. And we can see that in the same spot where that uh, abnormality was on the MRI, there's a hole in the metabolism. So that part of the brain doesn't have normal metabolism. And if you had epilepsy associated with this, you'd likely be a very good candidate for having an operation on your brain, epilepsy surgery. And many times we can cure children's epilepsy by doing surgery. So what causes epilepsy? Well, genes and our genetic heritage play a big role in it. In children, as I've been saying, there are a number of epilepsies that are really purely genetic. The children have inherited or have created, when they were being put together, an abnormal gene that causes abnormal growth in the brain or abnormal metabolism in the brain that causes the seizures. These are purely genetic forms of epilepsy and include childhood absence, like that generalized EEG pattern I showed you. Childhood absence has nothing to do with anything that's happened in that child's life, nothing that happened during the pregnancy or birth. The child was programmed genetically to start having seizures when they were five or six years of age. However, even in acquired epilepsies, there's a big genetic component. So people that were in a car accident and had an injury to their brain, some people develop epilepsy after that and some people don't. Some people with brain tumors develop seizures and some people don't. Some people that had a stroke develop seizures and some people don't. So why do some develop seizures and some don't? It's because of the genes that they have. And some genes predispose us to developing epilepsy if something else has happened to us. Channelopathies are a common group of childhood epilepsies due to abnormal <coughs> channels. And channels play a big role in how our brain functions. So in order to be able to send those electrical signals, the cells in our brain have little tiny, tiny passages that we call channels that open and close and let chemicals pass through them. And we have sodium channels and potassium channels and chloride channels. And those channels um, are all determined genetically. And if a child has a problem with one of those channels, they'll develop epilepsy. So again, childhood absence is due to a calcium channel. And uh, juvenile absence, which is another related disorder, is also due to a problem with calcium channels. Dervais syndrome, which many people have heard about on the news, um, is a rare but very serious form of childhood epilepsy, where children are very susceptible to having prolonged seizures, seizures that last hours, days, sometimes weeks. They're very hard to stop. That's called status epilepticus. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Dervais syndrome in a minute. But that's due to abnormal sodium channels. And benign neonatal familial convulsions is due to abnormal potassium channels. <coughs> 
Another uncommon but important to recognize form of epilepsy is due to abnormal signaling with receptors in our brain. And uh, it's directly inherited. So if a parent had it, they'd have a 50% chance of giving it to each subsequent child. So that's called autosomal dominant. And uh, that's due to uh, abnormal signaling using nicotinic acid receptors. And then there's a whole group of rare disorders that result in abnormal metabolism in your body. And uh, some of these are due to us not being able to use an important vitamin called vitamin B6 or pyridoxine, and that causes severe seizures, but they're completely controllable if the children take B6. Um, and there's some other vitamin uh, disorders. So what happens during a child's life when they develop epilepsy? Are we able to predict or guess what is going to happen next? Well, we know that some epilepsies have a really good prognosis for having the seizures come under control and for the epilepsy going away. Again, like the childhood absence that I keep referring to. That's a pretty, it's never good to have epilepsy, but it's a pretty good form of epilepsy to have if, if you had a choice. Another benign type of childhood epilepsy is called Rolandic epilepsy. The children have seizures only when they're sleeping, and they're infrequent. We often don't even treat this type of epilepsy because the seizures are rare, happen at home when the child's in bed, and they're only going to be there for a couple of years, and they're going to go away. So we refer to these as the idiopathic epilepsy syndromes. Unfortunately, other types of epilepsy have a really poor prognosis. It's not likely that we're going to be able to control the seizures with medicine. And the epilepsy is not going to go away. So these tend to be lifelong epilepsies that can have really a very major and sometimes devastating impact on that child's development and independence. And we often refer to these as the catastrophic epilepsies of childhood because they have such a big impact on the child's life. And these are things like West syndrome with infantile spasms, Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, and really any focal or partial onset epilepsy that has an abnormal MRI scan. These we refer to as the symptomatic epilepsies. If you look at everybody that has epilepsy, all those 1 in 26, about 3 million people in the United States, we can control seizures with medicine about 60% of the time. Those aren't bad odds, but that still means that 40% of children and adults, about a million people in the United States, um, are going to have seizures that just won't stop with medicine. And those people are referred to as having medically intractable or medically refractory epilepsy. How many medicines does it take to be able to predict intractability? Well, here's a result of one study. There's, this has been done a few different times. But in this study, they took 500 patients with new onset epilepsy, put them on the best medicine for their type of seizures, and they got 47% in green, 47% of the people seizure-free with the first medicine. If that didn't, medicine didn't work, they tried a second medicine, and they got another 13% seizure-free. And then with every medicine trial after that, 5, 6, 10, 15 different drugs, they only got another 4% seizure-free. So the best that we can do in a research study is to get just over 60% of the people seizure-free. So how do we treat epilepsy in 2015 at Texas Children's Hospital? and at any major epilepsy center. Well, we always start with medicines, and we have over 30 different anti-epilepsy medicines that are currently approved for use in the United States. Drugs don't always work, and if drugs don't work, we want to see if we can do surgery, because surgery offers a chance of cure, and we cure children's epilepsy all the time. We have different types of epilepsy surgery. Sometimes it requires opening your skull, and taking out part of the brain. 
We developed a new laser technology that lets us stop the cause of seizures through a tiny little pinhole. And sometimes we disconnect one part of the brain from another part. <coughs> but not everybody can have brain surgery. Sometimes the epilepsy is a type that you just can't do surgery. So then we have other treatments, like a special food that you eat called the ketogenic diet that can be really helpful for seizures. And we have electrical pacemakers that can get implanted in your body that stimulate different parts of your nervous system and your brain that help control seizures. The most common one and the only one approved for children is the vagus nerve stimulator. Here's a list of 21 of the most commonly used drugs. There's another 10 drugs that are less commonly used that I didn't put on this list. In that kind of purpley color are what we consider the old drugs or the first generation drugs that started with phenobarbital in 1912 and ended with uh, Depakine, Depakote that came in 1978. So that's the first generation of drugs. Um, the blue drugs are the first generation. The blue drugs are the second generation of drugs that started with Felbitol in the early 90s and uh, go up to uh, Ficompa that was approved last year here in the United States. Lots of drug options. Some drugs work better for some kinds of epilepsy. Some work better for other types. I want to just touch on the last few slides about specific types of epilepsy and how genetic testing can be so important. There's a very important sodium channel that's throughout our body and important in our brain that's really important in signaling for the nerve cells. And it's called SCN1A. It's a sodium channel. And we know the gene for this uh, sodium channel. And Dr. Pacino is going to tell us in a few minutes about how we can test for that gene. And if we identify a children that has an SCN1A epilepsy, that really guides us in our therapy. One of the challenges of genetic testing, though, is that children with really quite different types of a condition can have the same gene. So this exact same SCN1A mutation can cause something that is on what we call the GEPS plus syndrome, uh, GEPS plus spectrum, which is genetic epilepsy with febrile seizures plus. And the children might have just a simple febrile convulsion and never have another seizure for the whole rest of their life. However, at the other end of the spectrum, they can have something like Dravet syndrome, which is one of the more catastrophic forms of childhood epilepsy with those very prolonged seizures, very difficult to control. But it's the same gene that causes both conditions. And another severe form of childhood epilepsy called Doze syndrome. What's important to know if a child has a sodium channel disorder is that some of our medicines help control seizures by working on sodium channels. And if a child has an SCN1A disorder, the sodium channel medicines tend to make them worse. And I've seen so many children in my clinic where I've stopped their seizures by stopping the medicine because they were on the wrong medicine for their type of epilepsy and it was actually making them worse. So for most children with a sodium channel epilepsy, the medicines that would make them worse or should tend to be avoided are Dilantin, Tegretol, Triloptal, Lamictal, and Vimpat. These are otherwise really great medicines and some of my very first choices for other kinds of epilepsy, but for the most part, they should be avoided in these children. Children with Dravet syndrome and Doze syndrome tend to respond best to other medicines that don't work through sodium channels like Onfi, Zonagran, Keppra, Depakote. A medicine that is difficult to get in the United States, it's from Europe. It just received orphan drug status in the United States, so we're starting to use it, but it's still difficult to get hold of, called steropentol. We use the ketogenic diet. And then the vagus nerve stimulator can work really well for some of these children, especially the children with Doze syndrome. There's lots of research going on. I'm sure many people in the room are familiar with the interest in various forms of medical marijuana. 
and I was the first pediatrician and the first neurologist in Texas to be able to prescribe a specific form of medical marijuana uh, called CBD. Um, and uh, we're doing research studies using that medication, and it seems to be helpful for some children and not for others. And another study that we're going to be starting very soon using a drug that some of you might recognize called uh, fenfluramine. <coughs> and fenfluramine was half of the fenfen drugs that uh, were used in the 80s for weight loss and were taken off the market because it caused heart disease. Um, but uh, it seems to be really beneficial for particularly Dervais syndrome. Angelman syndrome is another rare but very special form of childhood epilepsy. And it's due to an abnormal gene on chromosome number 15. And uh, what's very interesting genetically about this condition is that if the child inherited the mutation from the mother, they have Angelman syndrome. And if they inherit that exact same gene from the father, they have a completely different condition called Prader-Willi that doesn't even involve seizures. Children with Angelman syndrome tend to have really severe and difficult to control epilepsy, but it's uniquely responsive to just one medicine. And I've seen so many children with Angelman syndrome that have failed 10 or 12 medicines, and we put them on clonazepam and they become seizure free. So it's really important to know the cause of the epilepsy. And curiously, and a medicine that we like to use for other kinds of epilepsy instead of clonazepam, because it has fewer side effects, Onfi um, doesn't work for Angelman syndrome at all. In fact, many of the children get worse on Onfi. Potassium channels are also important, just like sodium channels are and calcium channels in the brain. And a specific gene that uh, helps create potassium channels is called KCNQ2. And just like the sodium channel gene, this same gene can cause completely different types of epilepsy. So in some children, it causes one of the mildest, most benign forms of epilepsy that we ever see, which is called benign neonatal familial convulsions. Children have seizures for a couple of days in the first weeks of life, and then it goes away, and they never have another seizure, and they're totally normal for the rest of their life. But in other children, that same gene causes a devastating epilepsy called Odahara syndrome. And tragically, many of those children die at a young age because the epilepsy is so severe. One of our newest medicines works on, sodium, on potassium channels. And so we're just starting research studies to see if Patiga will help children with Odahara syndrome. And finally, glucose transporter deficiency, which is uh, something that's only been known about for the last 20 years or so, and uh, used to only be able to be diagnosed with a spinal tap or measuring how much sugar is actually in the spinal fluid. But now that we know what the gene is, we can do it with a blood test or a saliva sample. And uh, what's really important about this condition is that the body can't get glucose from the blood into the brain. And so the brain is starving and causes seizures and developmental delay and movement disorders. So we have to feed the, something, they have to feed the brain something other than sugar. And the brain usually just runs on glucose. So we change the body's metabolism using the ketogenic diet and we can feed the brain ketone bodies and it stops the seizures and helps these children. They need to stay on the ketogenic diet for the rest of their life. <coughs> so really the future of epilepsy diagnosis and treatment is in genes and genetic testing of different kinds. We really think that in the very near future, by doing specific DNA tests, we'll be able to understand what the cause of that child's epilepsy is, help predict the future, but also guide therapy and tell us which medicines to use. And we hope that the day will come that we'll be able to do the genetic test before we even prescribe the drug because the genes in that person will tell us which drug is going to be effective and which drug is going to be safe. <coughs>
management of epilepsy needs to focus on maximizing quality of life, which means as few seizures as possible and as few side effects from the therapy as possible. We can now identify people that aren't going to respond to medicine quickly. If you haven't responded to two medicines, the likelihood that you'll be seizure-free with medicine therapy is vanishingly small. And we need to see if that child can benefit from non-pharmacologic therapies like surgery. And it's an exciting time. There's really no more exciting time that has ever existed for neuroscience than now. And every day, week, month, and year, there's exciting and innovative new treatments that are rapidly emerging and changing children's lives. This is my team. We, we meet every Tuesday morning and we discuss children who might be candidates for brain surgery and carefully plan out whether surgery is an option. And it takes a dedicated team to do this. Thank you.